Thank you for inviting me. I planned to give, well, I am going to give a talk about church treasures, but I want to preface it with a little anecdote about an RE lesson that I had at school with a schoolmaster who had great difficulty keeping discipline. And he wished to illustrate the virtue of fortitude. And he said, imagine a bishop going for the night into a barracks. And despite the ribaldry of the soldiers, he insisted on getting out of his bed and saying his prayers. And there was a pause. He said, now, can any of you in the room now think of another example of fortitude? Long pause, wicked smile, and a hand went up. What about a soldier in a dormitory of bishops who refused to get out of bed to say his? <laughs> I hope that in this talk today, I want to give a perspective on the presentation of church treasures that is slightly wicked and, uh, uh, as it were, from, from the periphery, from the point of view of someone who loves visiting churches, who sees an enormous amount of them, and has a particular interest, amongst other things, in their contents and cultural riches of all kinds. But in making this sort of side, offering this side view, I must emphasize that I am not trying to be sort of snarky uh, metropolitan figure who comes out and mocks what I know are, from, partly from my own experience, the enormously uh, problematic demands that running a parish church makes on anybody who gets involved with it. By and large, I feel traveling around parish churches is an inspiring undertaking, precisely because you know how much is being done behind the scenes to make these things available. It is, after all, something of a modern miracle that in 21st century Britain, it is possible to travel around so much of the countryside, see a church and go in and find the door open, and really you have no idea what you will find within it. I love doing that, I do it all the time, and I am eternally grateful to the people who make that possible, which in this room happens to be you. So before I sort of get underway properly, um, I, sorry, that was really my introductory slide, but it's, I wasn't going to talk about it, just to emphasize the quality of the things that are in our churches. No other country in the world, in Europe, has such important things in public buildings scattered around the countryside. It is absolutely extraordinary. And you have to remind yourself of that as much as possible, particularly if you're responsible for one of these places. Because one of the points I want to make is it's very difficult to see familiar buildings freshly. But it is important, I think, for you who have responsibility for running them. Now, I need to begin by saying that nearly everything that tends to be talked about in, in, in parish churches tends to be uh, in re relationship to one group of buildings. I'm showing you a picture of Lastingham in Yorkshire here. It's a typical English scene of a church beneath the moors in rolling countryside. Now, it is frustrating, I know, for those of you who have parish churches that do not conform to this ideal. And it's, um, I think it is a great failing, in fact, that nearly always when people talk about parish churches, what they usually end up doing is talking about English rural parish churches. That is simply not um, a, 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 an inclusive category. And just to you know, make the point, this is um, a church, a Roman Catholic church at Burselm in part of uh, uh, Burton-on-Trent, built in, I think the foundation stone is laid in 1925. Now, my country life photographer, Paul Barker, has framed this building beautifully. It looks very attractive. But if you stand with your back to it, that's what you see. But St. Joseph's Burselm contains an absolutely astonishing series of inter interior fittings commissioned by the local art school, which was run, of course, by the potteries, and the congregation created the interior. It's stained glass, the mosaics is by the daughter of the art school director, and the paintings are created by out-of-work workers, mainly Catholic Irishmen, who uh, were suffering from the, th the recession in the 30s. It's an amazing building, and it absolutely does not conform to the type. That said, nearly everything else I'm going to talk about now in the seven or eight minutes I have left 
is going to focus on rural English parish churches. Not English, but rural churches. But I do think what I'm going to talk about actually affects this kind of building as much as the rural parish churches from which my examples are drawn. I also think um, it's a dangerous territory, this. Um, I think it's very easy to forget in your struggle to raise money and resources to do things for churches that money, when you have it, is not necessarily a blessing. <laughs> that is to say, more damage has been done by too much money than too little. And I also think there is real dignity in trying to make things work. It's all very well to have bonanzas of cash, but it doesn't necessarily make the final results any better. And I'm showing you here uh, my own parish church in London, which has some wonderful 20th century, 1960s uh, paintings in it, but most recently, through a donation, has um, what... Uh, I'm on camera, I must um, uh, modify my uh, comments on this, but uh, it's a rainbow, okay? And it's made of hand prints. Uh, and nobody likes it, even the people who did it. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily... You know, sometimes not doing things can be an improvement. Every now and again, you also... I'm actually missing a slide that may come up later, but forgive me. Um, every now and again also, you do see buildings that do things which are just quite clearly wrong. This is um, a, a clock face which sat in... A, 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 none of the buildings I'm talking about are going to be named... Uh, specifically, but uh, this is a clock face that sat in a graveyard in a very prosperous town for a very long period of time. It's not a viable or an appropriate solution for this thing. I have no idea why it ended up where it did, but it's fascinating. People do occasionally throw amazing things out of churches, and it's heartbreaking. Oh, this was uh, another kind of... Um, I wouldn't say killing with kindness, but I would say that it is a problem that many churches face, that individuals wish to make very generous donations to them and they wish to control the strings of how those donations are paid for. Now, um, I don't know the details of, of what happened here and it's, uh, op opinions may differ, but um, uh, um, I don't think these are appropriate furnishings for this space. Um, and that's my opinion, and you, know, you can give me a hard time if you disagree with me. And, and, and op opinions can vary. So when I travel around, I've decided what I would try and do for this talk is only to look at pictures that I had taken of churches in the last three months, that I'd visited in the last three months. And as architectural editor of Country Life, I have to say, I do get around quite a lot, and I see a lot. So I wanted to put together some of the things that when I see them afresh, I think are sort of absurd, but I understand why they happen. But if, you, if, you, if, if any of this resonates with you, go, when you go back to your own parish churches, just have a think about what I'm saying. As I say, I'm not trying to be snide or mocking. It is just extraordinary, though, what does happen in the public buildings that are parish churches. One of the most off-putting things that you can find if you're trying to attract visitors at all is that the signpost before you even get into a church is really a mess. Um, this is a, 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 a very handsome, well-maintained parish church, but I don't think you would particularly trust the person who designed the sign. Um, uh, it just requires someone to stand back and realize that needs replacement. It needs updating. Another really uh, interesting problem is doors, the doorway to a church. Now, I do not advocate ripping out historic doors or replacing them all in glass, but there can be circumstances where doors are very depressing or off-putting. Uh, a, a building with a really poorly maintained door is like a face with its eye poked out, I think. This I'm actually showing you as a cathedral example because I was involved in it. This is St. Albans. You may or may not be able to see the west porch there. They had a problem with um, vandalism on the doors and vandalism in the porches generally. And in fact, at my suggestion, I, um, it, this, this door was uh, repainted uh, in Pugin Red about two years ago. And as far as I'm aware, there have been no further problems with vandalism, and it actually looks like the front door to an operating church. 
Um, it, I think it's made a tremendous difference um, and uh, it, it's something to think about if you have a door that is really looking very, very shabby. A parish church example of this is St. Nicholas in King's Lynn, well, a, a chapel of ease. Magnificent 15th century uh, painted scheme has been re renewed uh, on that door. When you walk into a church, nearly always the West End, for better or worse, is the place where all junk gets placed. Now, there are hilarious examples of this, but I limited myself strictly to the last three months. But I think this is a pretty good case in point with kind of crib display, very dated tea machine, piano chairs scattered around. I know tidying churches up, I mean, and I, you know, I have responsibility for this too, is almost impossible. But it is something that as an outsider coming to a building, you just need to go in and see it freshly every time you arrive and see what looks messy. Another thing that you quite often find happening, though I have to say this is an exemplary um, example in Northumberland, this is a communion table turned into a place for leaflets. Now, as a matter of fact, this communion table has a protective covering to it, and the leaflets are very tidily arranged and sparse. But I have seen communion tables turned into sort of junk tables at the West End, often very, very fine pieces of furniture. I do think they deserve better than this. Um, and it is, if you go into your church and you notice that you have a rather fine table, which is serving to support leaflets, you might well think of rescuing it or simply tidying up around it and giving it some kind of protective cover. These are important uh, bits of furniture. The subject of guidebooks is something I could give an entire talk about and probably be quite boring about too, but this is the way to do it if you want to do it in numbers. It can be very confusing when you come into a church and there are so many leaflets and guidebooks that you end, away, come, end, away, end up coming away with nothing at all. This is very clear, well ordered, and it's clear where you put the money. That's the kind of guidebook I want to buy, whether it's large and elaborate, or even if it's simply a poster like this. This is on the Gower Peninsula, a tiny church. I thought a beautifully created poster that illustrated the things of importance in the church and told the narrative if you wanted to read it. Again, minimalist, but hugely effective at telling you what there is to see. You can get HLF grants and do much more ambitious things. This is uh, at Llancarfen, where this amazing 15th century set of wall paintings has recently been displayed. And I believe the HLF and the Welsh Government are amongst those who've given money towards um, its presentation. It's a little bit too much for my tastes, but clearly for the worthy burghers of Llancarfen, it does the business. A particular sort of um, annoyance of mine is um, church chests. Now, if any of us had a piece of furniture on our houses that was 500 or more years old, we would probably take care of it. But in my experience, most church chests are effectively grand dustbins. They're the places where people put everything that they can't quite find another place to put, but they don't want to leave it out with all the rest of the junk at the West End. This is a 15th century church I saw last week, 15th century chest. I don't have m lots of suggestions as to what you should do with these enormous bulky objects, but again, they have a dignity and importance. If you raise them off the ground, it at least makes them easier to look at and seem more significant. As a matter of fact, this chest, raised six inches off the ground, has nothing in it at all. It shows that it's been dignified in some way and is acknowledged to be important. I need to, just going to be two more minutes, I'm going to race through this. Over-labeling is another problem. I, I do sympathize that tombs can require um, an effort to understand the inscriptions and so forth, but I think producing really large uh, um, uh, labels and putting them all over the monument somewhat detracts from these objects themselves. There have been recently really wonderful changes to tombs that I'm aware of. This is an example in Oxfordshire, at Elm, a church I know very well, where for years this unsightly grill was erected to protect one side of the monument. The last few years, the grill has gone. It transforms this monument. Hooray! Somebody looking and understanding what it's like as a visitor to see this. 
This is another church where all the principal monuments are locked in a vestry and you have to stand on the choir stalls to get a glimpse of them. If you have important tombs, it is quite a good idea not to make them totally inaccessible. Because, I mean, I know I may be a nutter, but it is kind of maddening. Um, and I'm not trying to damage them, I just want to see them. Um, tired signs, in this age of the home printer and the computer, putting up signs like this filled with Maybugs doesn't look attractive, and you just need to change them. It's annoying, but it, did they deserve removal and replacement. An exemplary church in Leicestershire that I visited about uh, six weeks ago, this is Bottisford, even the, even the altar rail is open so that visitors can go up and look at the monuments beside the high altar. It's really wonderfully presented, beautifully kept church, I thought, and you know, the only visual intrusion perhaps is that red rope, and I think you'd have to be pretty precious to object to that. Flowers on tombs. It's not necessary to take objects that are 500 years old and make them the basis for flower arrangements. And it can occasionally be very damaging. And yet, I saw this less than two weeks ago, and it's quite a modest example, as a matter of fact. I have seen an entire basket of flowers with standing water filling a late 13th century brass. It's not a good idea. Even if we complain about bats quite reasonably, but it can also be very, very destructive, this. Exemplary work, Quennington in Northamptonshire. Um, this series of two monuments which have been um, completely uh, restored by the, uh, by the local community, 99,000 pounds raised, and nearly two thirds of that locally to repair and restore two monuments. As a final element to this, the school children of the local village school were involved with toothbrushes cleaning the marble here. What an exemplary project. And, you know, for all of us, if we have schools which are operating in relation to our churches, you know, the one group of people who are never bored are sort of seven to 11 year olds. Get, if you can get them in and involved with things like this, what a wonderful and transformative thing it can be. There is also the option of HLF money, and uh, this is another exemplary thing at Clantwick Major in Wales, a series of high crosses erected in what was formerly a ruin. It was completed about two years ago, but again, uh, really, really uh, majestic. Well, on that note, I hope that I have made you think a little bit about how objects in your church are presented. You may not have all your visitors quite as obsessive as I am about trying to see what are in churches. But I think actually, until you've seen it, it's almost impossible for the visitors to see it properly. That's why monuments get locked in, in, in vestries and things. If there's one discipline I would encourage you to, it is to take a camera and walk around your parish church when you're next there and try and imagine what a visitor sees as they walk through it and take pictures of it. Because if you can't see what's interesting when you're taking around a camera, nor can an informed and interested visitor, and you're losing them. Thank you very much.